أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق أجمعين سيدنا محمد عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وعملا صالحا متقبلا ورزقا حلالا طيبا يا أكرم الأكرمين وبعد So this is the second session of the Quranic Sciences uh, or Quran Sciences course um, in the first class, we talked about an introduction about how can we define uh, a divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is um, to, to get a proper definition of the Quran, you need to understand the meaning of wahi, of revelation, and then the concept of prophecy, and then concept of mu'jiza, definition of a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how the Islamic scholars and, and throughout history define the word mu'jiza, and differentiated between different categories of the mu'jizat or the miracles of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we also shed a light on um, the, the, the commonality of one message, one uh, essence of all the messages of the prophets and the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we started talking about the challenge, how the Quran challenged the Arabs at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to produce something similar to it. I mentioned the story of Al-Walid ibn Mughira and how he expressed explicitly uh, to, to his own people, to Abu Jahl, that I, I know all different kinds of linguistic styles and I know all different kinds of poetry and prose and rhetoric. And at the same time, I've never seen something like the Quran before. And that was after he was influenced, I touched it by the recitation of the Prophet wasallam. And then to elaborate more on this point, Understanding the fact that the mu'jiza or the miracle of the Quran is in the, in, in, in the mere fact of receiving the message, of being hit by the power of the words and the ayat of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this ayah, for example, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامُ الله. If any one of the mushrikeen of the polytheists or the, the unbelievers seeks your protection, then grant him protection so that he may hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means hearing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a proof in of itself, right? The hadith in the, in the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith, Al-Quran hujjatu laka aw alayk. The Quran could be a proof for you or against you. How can the Quran be a proof for or against me? So the Quran in of itself is a hujjah, is a proof. Hujjah means a proof. And it's enough for you to receive this message to be a proof for or against you. That's why he said, if, swamp, if one of them comes to you, the ayah in Surah At-Tawbah, if one of them comes to you and he's seeking you protection, give him protection. The ayah, the, the context, the, the, the bigger picture of the ayah is talking about the, the, the ahkam and the rulings of fighting uh, against the unbelievers. But this particular meaning of the ayah is, if he or she seeks a protection from you, give them protection until they hear the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means the hujjah, the proof between you and them is hearing is receiving the message of Allah. And it's a very intriguing that the ayah expresses with the word hearing because the, the, the Quran has an oral miracle. The, the, the concept of receiving the Quran, it's, it's based on an oral transmission. And this is a topic that we will talk about, inshallah, probably next week, how the Quran was transmitted to us. So it's about sama, hatta yasma'a kalam Allah. In a different ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِ He always asks this question, and the Quran repeatedly mentioned this. They say, why are not signs sent down to him from his Lord? Ayat here doesn't mean the verses of the Quran. Ayat here means signs. Why doesn't he have signs from Allah? They keep trying to challenge the Prophet وسلم, of making like very weird, extraordinary things like make the sky does so and so, make the earth does so and so. He used to ask for these very ridiculous challenges, things to be very abnormal so we can believe in you. And the Quran actually exposes their lies and, and says that even though you would do that, you were not going to, to follow you. You have a bigger miracle. You have a bigger sign that you are a messenger from Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul innamal ayatu Allah. He responds with him saying, say the signs are only with Allah. Wa innama ana nadhiru mubin. And say that I'm only a water, I'm only a clear water from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the following ayah says what? Awalam yakfihim anna anzalna alayka al-kitaba yutla alayhim. Isn't it enough, sufficient for them that we reveal to you the book which is recited to them? Why are they seeking more miracles if they have this book? So this ayah is also a need that this book in of itself is a miracle. Not only a miracle, is the miracle of the Prophet 
The Prophet ﷺ, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with multiple miracles. But the major and the main miracle of the Prophet ﷺ, the everlasting one was the Qur'an and is the Qur'an. And the biggest challenge the Qur'an had with, pe the, the Prophet ﷺ had with his people was through the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, in a culture and community that is full of the best public speakers, the best poets, the best orator, those people who established literally the court poets, as they called it, the, some certain, um, uh, like it was a kind of a, a primitive institution in which the poets would go and compete over uh, the, the how rhetorical and how eloquent their speeches and their poems is. And there are a judging committee that would judge between them. And once this committee grants uh, an announcement or grants the, the, the award for one of them to be the best uh, reader or the best poet, for example, that's it. This is a decision that will be made and everyone will be publicized everywhere. Sometimes you would copy some of the poems and would hang it on the walls of the Kaaba itself. This is the culture. This is just try to imagine the, the, the involvement of language and rhetoric in this culture. And the Quran is challenging in, in their bread and butter, as they say, in their very particular skill, in the very, in, in the very important, um, uh, the, the main thing basically that describes the culture of Arab was how good they were in language and in and, and different styles of writing and, and I mean different styles of speeches, poetry, poems, etc. I said last time that a lot of them were actually illiterate in terms of being able to write or read, but they were native speakers of this language and that was their thing, that was their skill of uh, using language to express about themselves, which is different from the rest of the communities of the other prophets like Sayyidina Musa or Sayyidina Isa and I did talk about this uh, before in uh, in the last class. And then we talked about the story of Al-Walid ibn, ibn al-Mughira and how he responded to the Prophet Sallallahu And I mentioned the question, why was the Quran revealed in Arabic? And we discussed this. And then after that was the challenge. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala told him, bring something like it. بِحَدِيثٍ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ And here you can see how the, the challenge was taken gradually, how the Quran challenged them over stages and over time as well. فَلْيَأْتُوا بِحَدِيثٍ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ let them produce a statement like it if they should be truthful. They are saying that you have made this up, you, you have fabricated this. Sure, bring 10 surahs or 10 chapters like it that have been invented. Like, do invent something if he did invent that. Call upon whoever you want besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in kuntum sadiqeen if you should be truthful. They couldn't do that. And then the the you see the, the, the downgrade of the challenge, like from a full Quran to 10 chapters, to even one chapter. Again, it's the, the same introduction or beginning of the ayah. Do they say about you that you invented it? Then produce only one chapter from, of, of the kind of the Quran. The same ending of the ayah. You seek the help of whoever you want, if you are actually truthful in what you're saying. And then they could not do something like this. And then the Quran publicized and affirmed the defeat of those people by saying, Now the Quran is literally establishing the end of this challenge, saying that you were not able to do this. And if mankind and the jinn too gathered in order to produce the like of the Quran, of this Quran, they could not produce the like of it, even if they were to each other assistance. Even imagine that all people, all people were with all their expertise and everybody comes together with even the jinn and they're trying to produce something like the Quran and the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you wouldn't be able to, to produce something like it. And again, we're talking about the best, uh, the highest level of, of, of eloquence and language that happened and existed in history was existing during that time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these ayat. But how was the reaction of the people to that challenge? Number one, there was a major state of denial. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that they are actually defeated about their main area of expertise. Even and as I mentioned about the story of Al-Walid -Al last time, when uh, he said to Abu Jahl, I know all different like stylistic features of language. And I still believe that this is not any of these. And even when he made up something to say about Quran that he was not himself convinced with, he said it's magic, which means still it's something beyond our imagination. It's something that we cannot conceive. 
And subhanAllah, they were okay to attribute it to magic, but they were not okay to attribute it to a higher power than this, which is the divine power, which is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they were defeated, so that's why they were in that very major state of denial. And instead of trying to produce something like the Quran, they did everything else. And this is the exact dalil, this is the exact evidence or proof why those people were defeated by this challenge. Number one, they just went, went for false accusations against the Prophet and the Quran. Sometimes they would make fun of the Quran. Sometimes they would make fun of the Prophet Sometimes they would just call it names, saying this is sihr magic, or the Prophet himself is a magician. Sometimes they would say this is kahana. Kahana is the soothsaying, and that was something very commonly practiced during that time. Or name the Prophet ﷺ himself to be a soothsayer. Uh, sometimes they would say he's an insane person, and that's why he's making up something. Sometimes they would say he's calling these things from jinn. All kinds of false accusations that you would think of, he did say about the Prophet ﷺ. But have they ever tried to do what the challenge is asking them to do? They always went for these other uh, uh, accusations and, and, and uh, claims about the Prophet Sallallahu or about the Quran, but they never tried actually to write something because they knew they cannot do it. And they knew it would be a huge embarrassment if they just tried to, to say something like what the Prophet Sallallahu uh, said. When they would fail and knew that all these uh, imaginations or all these accusations are not actually accurate, they started to accuse the Prophet Sallallahu saying, okay, you're actually calling this from someone else. And they said, Those are the tales of the legends of the former peoples, which he has written down. And they know that he cannot write or read, sallallahu alayhi wa So they said, It's being dictated for him every day, in the morning and at night. They said another ayah that, yeah, we knew about a person who lives in a different area, such and such area, and he is copying these words from this person. And the Quran exposed him and he said, this person even not. He's not even an Arab person. Imagine, like assuming that he did do that, the person himself is not an Arab person, but this Quran is Arabiyyum Mubin, is a very clear Arab. So whether false accusations or false arguments about the Quran, they couldn't, these two strategies did not work. So they decided to do a physical prosecution against the Prophet or persecution, I mean, against the Prophet and against the companions and, and they exiled them and they, they, they drove them out from their hometown and from their own city. They boycotted them for three years until they almost died out of hunger and thirst. The Prophet and the companions, they, they conspired against him. They tried to kill him actually, right before he migrated to al Madinah. Even after the immigration, they still were involved in wars and fights against him. Bloodshed, a lot of fights, a lot of problems. Over 23 years, constant hostility against the Prophet and the Sahaba with a constant inability to produce something like the Quran. So it is not only a claim that we make when we say the Quran was challenging for those people. And you can just think of it rationally. Was it easier for them just to sit down and write something? They, they could have easily formed a committee or a council of their best points, and they could have just sat and written something about that would challenge the Quran, and that's it. If they could do it even for one chapter, they could have defeated the, the, the entire point of the mu'jizah. It's not a prophet anymore. That's it. It's done. It's over. And instead of that, they went through all these different steps that you can see. And then the Prophet ﷺ died, and no one was able to do something like that. And even after his death, even during the wars of apostasy, as I mentioned this example last time with Abu Bakr, no one tried. Even those people who tried, they were ridiculous. Everybody made fun of them because they said, like, you're really not making any sense by using these words. So it's, it's kind of impossible to believe that the Quran was not a challenging or was not inimitable when you read the history of those people and the history of the Prophet وسلم, and what happened uh, between them. That takes us to the very important question and the main question of today, of today's session, which is, so what was the ultimate miracle of the Quran? What is then the ultimate miracle of the Quran? And if we believe that the miracle of the Quran was a literary miracle, was something about language, something about the, the rhetorical power of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a lot of scholars say to understand the, the miracle of the Quran, you need to know the, the science or the discipline of the rhetoric, which we call it balagha. And balagha has some off branches uh, or some like minor disciplines underneath it that one of them is called ilmul bayan. 
Naim al Bayan is how to convey the exact meaning to the audience in, in, in a nutshell. And, and Balagha in general, whether Ilm al Bayan or other ulum, there are three major branches under Balagha, but the Ilm of rhetoric in general, it teaches you, number one, how to evaluate and assess uh, and know your audience that you are targeting by your speech, and then how to convey the message in the proper sense. Then number three, how do you beautify your language and add more rhetorical styles and features that makes your, your style beautiful and appealing to the audience. So balagha is about this, which is different than grammar. Grammar talks about the syntax, like, talks about the structure of the words in terms of the, the nahu, and, and, and then afterwards, the, another ilm branched off, which is called morpho morphology or sort of, there are a lot of ilum, there are a lot of linguistics around this. But the core, the ilm that delves into the core meaning of the ijaz, the inimitability of the Quran, is ilm balagha, the, the rhetoric. So if you believe that the, the ijaz or the inimitability of the Quran was about this, in what sense? Are we talking about the words of the Quran? Are the Quran, is the Quran mu'jiz, inimitable in its own words? And I don't think so, because these words have already been there even before the Quran. Like the, the, the word al-nas, or the word al-falaq, or the word uh, qul, or the, all these, try to imagine words, break down the Quran into just words. The ijaz is in the words themselves? Apparently no, because these words are the same words of the same language that we're using. We use a lot of words of the Quran in our daily life conversations and the speeches, right? So it's not in the words themselves. Okay, is it in the wording structure? Is, is it in the sentences when we put words together and now we have full sentences? Is it, this is the ijaz of the Quran? And probably no, because then every composition can be potentially miraculous. When someone, like a genius in language, or someone who's a great poet and can just put some sentences and some very unique structures, that means it's miraculous and mu'jiz and inimitable? Actually, no. Okay, is it in the syntax, the i'rab, how, how the i'rab is actually perfect and all the syntax is correct? And you know there's the ilm of i'rab that people who study grammar Arabic language gets trained on? No, because there are a lot of eloquent uh, texts that can actually qualify for this. Then is it in the linguistic styles of, of the Quran? Probably no, because poetry has marvelous and amazing and magnificent styles and, and, and themes. Okay, is it about the meanings? It's not about the words or the structures or the stats. Is it about the meanings? Probably also no, because some of these meanings did exist in other scriptures and books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, right? So these things do exist in the Quran. So just like to imagine what I'm, the, the point I'm trying to make, these points, all these points, words, word and structures, syntax, uh, linguistic styles, uh, meanings, all these are in the Quran, they do exist in the Quran. But I'm trying to identify what is the exact point of inimitability? What is the exact point of adjust? This is the point, not that I'm negating these things exist in the Quran, but I'm saying what is unique, what is different about the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So if it's not one of these, so what is it? What is the, the, this point of inimitability of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Here comes the, one of the very important points about Ijaz al-Qur'an and always pops up the, the, one of the most famous names of the scholars who are talking about this issue, Imam Abdul Qahir al-Jurjani, rahimahullah, from the fifth century. Imam Abdul Qahir al-Jurjani wrote the most important book on Ijaz al-Qur'an and the inimitability of the Qur'an. It's called Dala'il al-Ijaz, Dala'il al-Jam'i Dali, which means the proofs or the evidences, the evidences of Ijaz, the, the evidences of inimitability. It's a large volume book. And it's, it's very unique, and they, they consider him to be one of the founders of rhetoric and balagha. And imagine he wrote this book very early in history that most of the terminologies of balagha were not established, well established, or, or uh, well like defined and articulated yet. The concepts are there for sure. The language was at its peak of eloquence, but in terms of the development of the science of the discipline, wasn't really at its peak yet. So for sure we should differentiate between these two things, exactly like grammar. So those native people that were talking about, they knew grammar as a native language, but they didn't know the terms, right? They don't necessarily know subject, object, adverb, adjective, these things, but they speak the highest level of language. Same thing that happened with most of the disciplines is the way the discipline would develop over history. So Imam Abdul Qahir, in that very early time, he authored this entire book, and his main motivation was there were some other sects in Islamic history who claimed some... Uh, like they made some wrong arguments about proving the ijaz with the inimitability of the Quran. Some of them said uh, the Quran of itself is not actually inimitable. It's the fact that those people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them unable to do something like that. 
So the mu'jizah is in the power of Allah by enabling, by this, uh, enabling those people from bringing the Qur'an. And he wanted to defeat this argument because he said, no, the Qur'an in of itself is challenging and the challenge was real. What the Qur'an said was real. The Qur'an was really literally challenging those people. It was not a metaphorical statement from the Qur'an. Otherwise, why would the Qur'an keep repeating it? Right? Otherwise, why would the Qur'an declare publicly that after the phases of, of, of challenge, the Qur'an announces publicly that you all, even you would bring every single human being, every single living being, humans or jinn, you wouldn't be able to do it. The Qur'an wouldn't challenge someone who knows that uh, he's even unable to take the challenge. This is not a challenge then, right? You cannot challenge a blind person telling him, can you see these things? Right? If somebody is blind and you can see and you challenge him over sight, right, over seeing something, it's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. So Imam Abdul Qahir said the same thing. He said, no, absolutely no. The Quran was having a real challenge. And he's telling those people, go ahead, try it. Try, do, do something. Try to put some words and sentences together and try to, pr to bring something like the Quran. And, then after, and that was basically the biggest motivation or incentive for him to write this book. And then after that, he said, okay, how can we produce a theory to understand language in the shade of understanding the ajaz or the inimitability of the Quran? And he talked about different aspects of literary composition or, or and the, what he called, and this is as, as known nowadays to be the communication theory, he taught about the relationship between forms and meanings. He said we have forms, and, and forms basically talks about words, and we have meanings, and there are, there are relationships between both, right? So this is, this is the, the, the aspect of, of something to be literary or rhetorical or powerful in, in, in a speech or writing. And then he said, words do not mean anything until they are structured. So again, the words that, that I thought about, like just random words, they don't mean anything until you put them together, but in a very particular way. That's why he then said, significance of a structure, of a structure is only due to the power of a special arrangement between the words. There is a very, very special arrangement between the words that makes a statement, a sentence, or a text to be very powerful and to be then inimitable. This kalam or this uh, theory might sound very philosophical, but let's take one example that Imam Abdul Qahir talked about and uh, see how can we, we test the power of structures and not them in the way he, uh, he, mentioned. he mentioned. He mentioned for sure a lot of examples, but this is one of the examples. He said, look at this verse of poetry or poetic line uh, in which the poet says, and all the poetry is cited for sure, it's from the very original uh, poetry that, that we call it Asr al-Ihtijaj, right? The era of Ihtijaj. The era of Ihtijaj means if you quote some poetry from this era of time, that means this poetry 100% eloquent, 100% native speaking person, 100% uh, correct grammatically. So he said, the poet says, سَالَتْ عَلَيْهِ شِعَابُ الْحَيِّ حِينَ دَعَ أَنْصَارَهُ بِوُجُوهٍ كَدَّ نَامِيرِ سَالَتْ عَلَيْهِ Said flood over him the narrow lanes of the quarter. Quarter is shi'ab like that quarter, like it's like a small district or a small area of people. This way, this is what he means. When he called his supporters with faces like gold coins. For sure, all of his translation does injustice to the to, to poetry, but I'm trying to just convey the point that he was trying to make. Again, flood over him the narrow lanes of the quarter when he called his supporters with faces like gold coins. Right. And then he said, try to pause here and, and ponder and reflect on this poetic line. And try to notice the special arrangement of the line and the design of the expression in terms of the, in terms of the, the word order. Right? There's something in Arabic language that is called word order. التقديم والتأخير. Right? Sometimes you, you, you would change the order of the words in the Arabic language. So try to reflect on it. Try to understand what is special about this arrangement. And then after you do that, Okay, try to read it again and try to change the word order that, that what we call the pre-posing and post-poning. It's very common terminology in the Arabic grammar. To so try to change that. And then he said, okay, I'm gonna help you do this. Try to rephrase the line by removing the positions of the prepositions and the adverb. So you see what I, what I actually colored with red. Salat alayhi shi'abu al-hayyi hina. Hina is the adverb, alayhi is the preposition, harful jar. And then change the order. So say, which means in English, 
flowed the narrow lanes of the quarter with faces like gold coins over him, sorry, gold coins over him when he called to his supporters. Okay, let's read it again. Flood over him the narrow lanes of the quarter when he called his supporters with faces like gold coins. Over him when? Try to remove or to change basically the positions in the sentence and say flood the narrow lanes of the quarter with faces like gold coins over him when he called to his supporters. How do you feel about the change of these words and how do you feel about the integrity of the line? Is it easy when you get a, an eloquent statement, uh, a beautiful rhetorical line of poetry, and you change the order of the kalam, the order of the words, the structures of the words? How, how do you feel about it when you, you haphazardly change it? This is what he's trying to make. So like, just change it. Like, just remove the, the, the position of some, some articles or some uh, adjectives or adverbs or prepositions, and then see what is the final product. And what I mean here by how do you feel and what he means by how do you feel, it's not just about your gut feeling, do you really like it or not? This is not what he means. He's saying that there are standards, right? There are rules. There are, there are things that you need to follow to appreciate and understand the power of structures. It's not, he's not saying that, yeah, it's actually subjective. Everyone can just like play around with the words of poetry and then whatever you like, whatever you feel, it's good. That would be the, the, the good verse of poetry. It is not about that. They, they take poetry seriously. And for sure, we take the Quran much more seriously that it's not easy to say, okay, I can actually change a couple words in the order of the Quran and probably it would give the same meaning. Or, or not only the meaning, it would probably would give actually the same meaning if you explain like tafsir, but it would give the same power and the very profound, powerful uh, feeling you get when you read it. The, the feeling that when a native speaker among those people would hear an ayah from the Quran, you would feel defeated. You would feel very overpowered because they can actually produce or bring something like the, the, the Quran or the ayah of the Quran. And then to, to understand this theory of nadam, the nadam of, of regular speech as this line of poetry that I mentioned, we need then to understand the, the composing stages of nadam itself. How do you do this nadam? So we call it nadam. Nadam, let's say there's no really one word as a term that can translate it, but let's say that the structure, the word structures. Uh, we have this in Arabic language and probably in most of the languages, right? We have letters that compose uh, words. These words would be nouns, verbs, and articles. This grammar one one We have words and those words can compose sentences. We have composition of, of rhetorical verses, right? Or rhetorical uh, statements or sentences. And then like, which means a high level. It's not merely some sentences. There are a composition of sentences next to each other, which makes a point, for example, right? This is the difference between two and three. And then we have rhyming. A rhyming would make the speech, the writing, the, the poem, the text, like more appealing and more beautiful and easier to follow. And it's smoothly transitioning between points, right? We have rhythms, which is a kind of a higher level in terms of the rhetoric and, and having rhyming with rhythms. And, and if you're talking about poetry, for example, that involves something that we call uh, the poetic meters or that make sure uh, the patterns of each verse is going correctly and, and soundly with the rest of the poem. And then after that, you would come up with a product. This product, we call it poetry. If it's rhythmed or rhymed in a in certain way, we have prose, which is a kind of a high level of literary or, or rhetorical speech, but not rhymed and, and doesn't have necessarily rhythms like poetry. We have oration or public speaking skills or public speaking a fasaha or eloquence, or eloquence. Those are the compositions of kalam in general, whether in written form or in, in, in speech or speaking. Quran is none of these, right? Quran is none of all of these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّهُ لَكِتَابٌ عَزِيزٌ Indeed, it is a mighty book. If you notice up until now, we are getting a lot of things that Quran is not like that. We're going to the highest level of poetry and the highest level of language, and we're still saying, yeah, but the Quran is above this. Right? We're getting to the, the highest level. We had brilliant scholars and minds in history who digged into the depth and the deepest side of languages. And they thought about linguistic philosophies and they thought about rhetoric, they thought about grammar, morphology, uh, syntax, all these different ulum and disciplines around the language. And we're still saying that Quran is none of these. So what is then the linguistic work of the Quran? How can we understand them? What is the uh, the the, the, the linguistic meaning or the linguistic miracle of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
in general, we can summarize the linguistic miracle of the Quran to, to say it's, it's this harmonious intertwining of this composition that we call it nothing. Again, we, we, I'm going to keep using the word nothing because it's the most famous theory about the inimitability of the Quran. And you can find a lot of references and articles about it if you want to read more about it, for sure in Arabic more than English, but both are available. So th there is a certain harmony between the structures and the nadam of the, 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 the ayat of the Quran. You can look at it from all these different perspectives. You can look at it from an articulation point of view, how the Quran is very articulate, very precise in delivering and conveying the meaning. It uses the exact word meant to, uh, to, to deliver a certain meaning. The structure of words that I just talked about, how, how the Quran uses taqdim wa ta'khir, the pre-posing and post-posing of words, how, why the Quran sometimes the subject is before the, 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 the verb, the verb is before the subject, the object is actually at the beginning, right? Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Why iyaka before na'budu? Why not na'buduka? Why not we worship you and you we worship? Why? All these different styles, the Quran involves that in the most unique way. And, and then after the structure of words, we talk about a very unique, use of rhetorical devices, such as all these different kinds. The, the metaphor, which is very famous and it's very repetitively uh, and repeatedly mentioned in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, using figurative speech to express about a meaning. The simile, which we call it in Arabic language, at tashbih when you want to, uh, to compare two things, to, to liken something to, to, to the other. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, said, then your hearts hardened and became like cracks to even harder. A heart is not a rock, but it's, it's a simile. The Quran is likening these two examples together to paint a picture for you, to make the, the meaning more appealing and to fix it more uh, in your mind. Uh, using allegory is something very common in the Quran as a full picture, as a full imagination, full scenery of imagining something, right? When the Quran talks about the magnificent power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a certain uh, expression about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most powerful and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most magnificent subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hyperbole in the Quran, the, what we call it the, the mubalagha, right? Which is in, in, in a positive way, the, the, in, in, in language and in, in the scientific language, the author intends deliberately or intentionally to exaggerate something to deliver a certain meaning. And this is something also, and the word exaggeration might sound to have a kind of a negative connotation, but here it means it's intended, it's on purpose to, to deliver something, to warn you, for example, if it is something, or to, to bring you closer, to make you, uh, to, to grab your attention towards something uh, specific. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, describes how the Muslims were very stressed out during the, the battle of the Hazab, when the Confederates came and, and uh, and they were trying to just root out all the Muslims from al Medina and to uh, kill them all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described how stressful and how fearful they were. And he said, When they came upon you from above you and from below you, and when the eyes grew wild, and the hearts reached to the throats. And you know that the heart will never come up there, right? But it's, it's a kind of a hyperbole that the Quran is telling you that it was that bad, it was that stressful. Me, after 15 century of this incident, I can't imagine how stressed the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were when I read something like that, right? So it's a rhetorical style, uh, or a rhetorical device, as we call it, uh, that the Quran uses a lot. The personification is something very, very powerful and profound in, in, in the Quran. When the Quran, like, uh, inanimate some objects or, or abstract meanings to make it very uh, like clear to the mind and to make the heart also able to connect uh, with it more. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, When did, uh, when we offered the trust, the heavens, the earth and the mountains, but they refused to be it, And they, they shrank when we, we, we entrusted or we well to entrust him with that. They were very concerned about accepting this interest. And then the insan uh, accepted to be right. So it's a personification to tell us that you have a big deal of a responsibility that we, we will to give it to the heavens and the earth, but it was really hard for them to be right, right? 
So it's a personification of a very abstract meaning, right? That, that the heavens and the earth, this, these two magnificent creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot stand, cannot be carrying something heavy like this, but you accepted that challenge. So you need to be up for it. All these different styles or devices that Quran actually used to deliver meanings. The versified stylistic features of the Quran. You find all these different styles together to build up one picture, right? You find like a very smooth transitioning between themes in the Quran. The beautiful thing about Quran is something probably we as modern people cannot really relate to is one surah talks about multiple things, right? There is no this unified theme for each chapter. There's no such a thing. You find one surah, even short surahs, talk about multiple things. Story, and it talks about Yom Al-Qiyamah, and it talks about a Fiqhi Hukum, and it talks about something about manners and akhlaq, something about the unseen, something about human hearts and spirituality. Very diverse meanings, right? That's why it's actually the unusual when you find something very consistent for a long time in the Quran. We say, for example, the story of Yusuf Ali's salam is the longest story, but it's the only one that took that long, like pages, to talk about basically almost the same story, right? Yes, for sure, there are some injections of meanings and lessons in the middle, but the main theme is the story. But this is not very usual in the Quran. And that was something very appealing and very familiar to those people back in the days. If you read an old Arabic poem, it's actually the same, right? If you want to read a poem for a poet for, for who wanted to describe his uh, hunting trip, right? We would start with Ghazal, talking about romance, and we would talk about his horse, we would talk about his bow or uh, his... Uh, uh, sword, for example, and then he would talk about some problems that happened in his tribe, and then he would talk about some just abstract meanings, some wisdom, some uh, advice, he'd talk about his brother, he would talk about his friends, he'd like multiple themes in the same point. We talk about like 50, for example, verse point, not talk about that, like something big like the, the Quran, right? It is something very familiar, and sometimes we do not really relate to this because it's a little bit uh, strange for us, but if you understand the culture, the, and when I say culture, not only culture of people, but also the linguistic culture of that time, this is something that was very, very common and very unique for those people. And that was part of the challenge, by the way, as well. That yes, it changes the themes all the time. But look at the smooth transitioning between the themes. Can you do this in poetry? That was part of the challenge from the Quran to those people. That's why the consistent quality was something very, very important about Quran. You cannot find a human being that can keep producing or inventing speeches for 23 years and it maintains the same quality. And this person was the Prophet That's why it was not his invention. It was not his speech. It was the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he was the greatest poet or the greatest speaker ever, he cannot maintain all this level, all the same level of rhetoric and same level of eloquence all that time. You can't. Try to, to read the biggest and the best works of any famous poet in any language. Shakespeare, for example, try to read his, his novels or his, his poems, for example. They're not at the same level of eloquence. They're not at the same level. Uh, and even the people who criticize the critics of, of, of poetry and prose and, and uh, literature and, and literary works in general, you'd find these things, right? That, yeah, this poem was unique. This poem was much better than the other one. When we do comparisons, people who study literature, and, and we understand, yeah, this point was really brilliant in this uh, imaginary that he introduced in this point, but he actually failed to do the same thing in this other point. And we contrast meanings, all these exercises that we do when we study linguistics, it doesn't really work with the Quran because the Quran maintained one level and it wasn't revealed at once. It was over 23 years, right? It was responding to real events. It was talking about real people. It was mentioning names. It was pointing out things that people can see. It's a very, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, it's very interactive and engaging with everything that happens in the society. And at the same time, it maintains the same level. It maintains the same level of uh, eloquence and, and, and rhetoric. That's why the eloquence and even the sound of the Quran was different, right? Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with this science of tajweed. We developed the science how to just utter the words of the Quran, which has some unique features beyond reading a regular text in Arabic, right? We have certain things that we only do in Quran. We only do Madd in Quran. We only do some certain Idram in Quran. We have these very specific particular, particular uh, uh, pronunciations and utterances of words that only belong to the Quran. It doesn't belong to poetry. When you read poetry, you didn't do Idram and Ikhfa and these things, right? Just read regular Arabic. Yes, so Fat and Huruf in general are the same, but the very techniques that we use in reading the Quran, the only are made for the Quran, which is something also unique about the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you go through these points again, articulation, structure of words, unique 
use of rhetorical devices, versified stylistic features, consistent quality, eloquence, and even the sound of the Quran. This gives you an idea, a glimpse only, of why the Quran is in the highest level of rhetoric. And then, why wasn't the Quran then revealed as poetry? If poetry was the main thing for those people, right? And we, and like, Arabs in general believe that poetry is the highest form of language. Highest in terms of eloquence, high, highest in terms of the power of it, highest in terms of that there is, there is an elite culture about poetry as well. It has a lot of merits that does not exist in any other form of language. So poetry is the main thing. But yet the Quran was not actually revealed in, in, in poetry. Number one, we need to understand the nature of poetry. It actually contra contradicts the nature of Quran, right? Because poetry is, is majorly about imagination, about exaggeration, about suppressing, about emotions, suppressing about feelings. A lot of times, it suppresses about things that didn't actually happen in reality, right? The Quran says, about poets, that they say what they do not do. Now, I'm saying in a negative sense, by the way, the Quran doesn't mean to condemn or to criticize poets that much, but just means that poetry, just poetry, it's, it's a sort of entertainment for people. It's a cultural entertainment, right? That's why singing was actually a branch of poetry. So it's a kind of entertaining thing. Yes, some of it is important. Some of it is, is, is uh, beneficial in terms of like uh, materialistic gain out of it, right? But pure language uh, perspective, it's all based on imagination. It's all based on emotions. It's all based on uh, just competing over the power of its expressions. Quran is not about that. Quran is a book of guidance. Quran states facts. Quran talks to the minds and the hearts of people. Quran wants to convey a certain message and wants to shape the world view of people, right? Quran doesn't want to move people by some emotional speeches or some emotional words, or some emotional structures. Doesn't want you just like to cry over some words or to feel very moved or touched. This does happen with the Quran, which are good, but this is not the main purpose. The main purpose, it's a book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was revealed to be guidance for people. So it shapes your aqidah and it gives you a manual how to practice aqidah in your life. So Quran is not like poetry. It's completely different nature uh, from, from, from poetry. And then some people said, okay, does the Quran include some poetry in it? And the answer is, what do you mean by poetry? If you mean some ayat that happen to be in the form of a certain poetic meter that we know in the science of Arud or poetic meters, yes. So in the science of Arud, Proskity, they called it, or the poetic meters. Th there are certain patterns that you have to build your poem on. You didn't just like put some rhymes, some rhyme words, and that would be called poetry. It's not like that. There are meters that you have to make sure your poem qualifies for. So these meters, and there are like a, about 16 different meters for, for poetry. And your poem has to qualify for one of them. So there are some small sentences from the Quran or full sentences from the Quran that qualify to be on one of those meters. And that, that did happen. That actually existed in, 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 in the Quran. Uh, the scholar said, when Allah SWT says, Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima, it's actually a poetic mirror. Bahru al-kamil. Right? Bahr is the word of the mirror. For Arabic language. Call it Bahru al-shi'r. Bahr means literally the sea of poetry, but it means that the pattern of, of, of a, a pattern of a point. So Bahru al-Kamil, it qualifies for the taf'ilat, for the structure of this poem, of this pattern. Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. It, it works on one of the meters of, of these points. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nasrun min Allahi wa fathun qareeb. It's actually, it has certain rhythms that, that works for one of the meters of poetry. There are a lot of examples. There are some scholars who wrote on, on this, uh, um, on this point or topic of, Quran has some certain uh, words that work or qualified for poetic meters. But do we call this poetry? So if you say yes, it actually it coincides, it, 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 it coincides or it, it, it happened to, uh, to be in, a, in one of those patterns. Do we call it poetry? The answer is no, because poetry cannot be poetry unless you intend it to be poetry. So me now speaking to you, right? And in my speech, my lecture, uh, or my presentation, it happened that few words came in a certain rhyming way that had certain rhythm, right? That by coincidence, it was actually uh, qualified to be one of those poetic meters. That, that, does that mean that what I said is actually a verse or a poetic line? Does that mean that I'm actually a poet? Right? Nobody would say that. And it's the same thing about the, the Quran. 
If it did happen like that, doesn't mean it's poetry. It's beyond that. And a simple evidence for this, those people never said that, yeah, it is actually like really a poetry. Yes, they claim that as the Quran said that the Prophet is poet, but they didn't say this poetry. They negated this. They said, as al Walid ibn Mughira said, as I mentioned last time, this is not poetry. We know poetry. We should have stopped fooling ourselves. Poetry is not that. This is not poetry. It's something else. So if it did happen like this, that doesn't mean the Quran is a poetic uh, book or, or, or a big poem, for example, or, or, or a, a compilation of a group of poems. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said something very interesting about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, that we did not give him knowledge of poetry and it is not befitting for him. That's not his job. This is not the job of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why the Sahaba mentioned some beautiful stories about this. And they said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never chanted like poetry in, in the literal sense of the chant. He would say some examples, some verses sometimes, but he never like literally chanted. And that was a big deal. Uh, like knowing poetry, memorizing poetry, chanting poetry was something very common. He had shu'ara even, he had poets, right? We call him the poets of the Prophet. He had Hassan ibn Thab, it's one of, one of the greatest poets. He had Abdullah ibn Rawaha, one of the greatest poets. Those people wrote a lot of poems, but he wouldn't chant. He would listen though, right? He would actually ask them to say poetry. He would love Hassan ibn Thab to say some poems, to criticize or attack the, the unbelievers in the battles or to, 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 uh, to praise the Sahaba and their jihads and all these things. He, he used to love that. He used to defend the Prophet and the Prophet would make dua for him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him the Jannah. And one time, uh, the Prophet ﷺ told him, like, say it, like, say, like, say this poetry. And Ruh al-Qudus ayyidu. Jibreel himself is here to support you when you were doing that. And that was his appreciation, uh, ﷺ, for this beautiful uh, kind of, of uh, and, and to the power of, of language and poetry at that time. But he himself, he wouldn't really chant poetry, ﷺ. He said, رُبَّمَا أَنْشَدَ الْبَيْتَ الْمُسْتَقِيمَ فِي النَّاتِ He would rarely chant one line of poetry. Right? They said, they noted that one time he chanted one line of Abdullah ibn Rawaha and he said, uh, He's sleepless. He doesn't sleep because in, in, in that time he's defending the ummah and taking care of the affairs of this ummah when the, the, the polytheists and the mushrikeen are just like in deep sleep. And but actually, multiple narrations and, and, and stories in the seerah. Uh, say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would try to see a line of poetry, but he wouldn't be able to say it in the right order of words because he doesn't memorize it, which was really beautiful. Once, and Abu Bakr Abdullah, for example, was a huge uh, scholar of poetry in terms of like, he knows a lot of poetry. He was very eloquent, Sallallahu Alaihi So he said that once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kafa bil Islami wa shibi lil it's sufficient. Uh, for Islam and old age to, to make a person uh, mindful. It's just me trying to paraphrase the, 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 the verse. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu like kind of smiling and said, Rasulullah, the poet didn't say it like this, right? He wanted to correct him. He said, the poet said, And he, here you can notice the rhythms and, and, and the rhyming. He said like, you only chanted half of the verse and at the same time you also changed the order of the uh, of the, of the sentence or the line. And at that, in a different version of the story, Abu Bakr and Umar were there and they smiled and they said, Nashhadu in Nakala Rasulullah. Like, we testify, I believe that, in Nakala Rasulullah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wa ma alamnahu shi'r. Right? We did not give him knowledge of poetry. Wa ma yanbaghi that. It is not befitting for uh, the Prophet. Same thing, when he says something that happened to be according to one of the poetic meters, that, this does not mean that he was a poet. It was reported also that during the Battle of Hunayn, when, uh, uh, when the, there was a very strong comeback from the, the people of, of the West Coalition, a lot of tribes who uh, had a big coalition against the Prophet Sallallahu and then the Muslims were really killed so bad. And then he wanted to strengthen the, the spirit of Muslims and to uh, encourage them to fight more. He shouted out loudly, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying, أنا النبي لا كذب أنا ابن عبد المطلب. I'm the prophet, no doubt, and I'm the son of Abdul Muttalib. And it was rhymed in Arabic language. And that would probably qualify to, to, to be a, a poetic line, but that doesn't mean that he's a poet, sallallahu alayhi wa Also one day, same day actually in Hunayn, he was injured and he in, the, in his hand, and he said, Hal anti illa wa fi So like, 
then what? You are injured. Then what? You are bleeding, and you are doing this for the sake of Allah. It was also kind of a a poetic style, but this does not mean that he was a poet. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Same thing we see about the Quran, and that was done by the wisdom of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that the Quran that the Prophet Sallallahu alaihi wasallam doesn't know poetry. And by the way, we do not take this ayah to to criticize or to devalue poetry. It is not befitting for him because he is the potter and messenger. This doesn't mean that the job of poetry or the, the poetry itself is, is actually bad, right? We, we cannot make this dalil, we cannot make this inference from, from this ayah. Shi'ar is very valid, it's very important. The Sahaba explained the Quran to us through poetry. Abdullah ibn Abbas said uh, that you need to learn how to understand Quran through the poetry of Arabs because that would, would make you understand the meanings, the structures, and all these things to talk about. If you read these poems, that would actually help you much, much more to understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's probably one of the only ways to understand the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a proper sense. So this ayah doesn't infer by any means that poetry is bad, right? Otherwise, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, You've never read a book before that, and you've never handwritten something before. Does that mean that we can make an inference or a sidlar from the ayah that writing or reading is bad? Absolutely not, right? Because it's something particular and special about the Prophet It's for a wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will. Same thing about poetry. And it's not befitting for him for his position and rank as a Prophet uh, uh, So this is about the Quran and, and poetry. And here comes another question. How about the other divine books? How about the other books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed uh, and to, to other Prophets and Messengers? The first thing we need to understand, there are different aspects of their jazz and lamentability and challenge. And I talked about this last time, that what was the biggest thing that the community of Isa alayhi salam were, expert, were experts or, or what was their main area of expertise? Community of Musa alayhi salam, community of any other prophet or messenger, Ibrahim alayhi salam, all those different messengers. Every community, every ummah had their own thing, their own unique uh, perspective. So... For sure, all prophets and messengers had miracles, but in terms of the, the, the miracle of the Quran and its inimitability as, a, as an Arabic book, it is something that no other book had actually shared with uh, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the Quran. If other books had miracles, they had miracles about talking about the unseen, which was, we're going to talk about the Quran as well, talking about inscription of hidden matters, talking about things that people didn't know about. Yes, the meaning itself is miraculous, but the language for is not compared to the book uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not challenge those people by the language of their books, right? Did not challenge the questions with the language, did not challenge the, uh, Jew, the Jews with, with, with the language. It was something unique about the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And for sure that was also for the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we would claim, and I would for sure be biased when I talk about this, that the nature of Arabic language also has a role in this argument. That it's, the Arabic language is very unique about its structures. It's very, very vast in its styles. Imam al-Shafi had a brilliant uh, quote or a statement when he said, لا يحيط بلسان العرب إلا نبي. He said, no one can encompass the knowledge of Arabic language except a prophet. Which means that a prophet through a revelation, because you cannot, if you're a regular, normal human being, you cannot really encompass the language of Arabs. That's why the, the, the high, high level of scholars of language, they are very careful before talking about a linguistic matter or correcting or uh, something in, uh, that we might think it's a mistake in language. It's a very hard, it's a very hard science to understand or to encompass all the different aspects of the Arabic language. And then this ayah, for example, talking about the mu'jiza of, of Musa alayhi salam, when he uh, threw his uh, stick and it became a snake uh, that devoured all the rest of the sticks or the snakes or the rest of the magicians in front of Pharaoh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describing the conversation between Musa and the magicians of Fir'aun, قَالُوا يَا مُوسَىٰ إِمَّا أَن تُلْقِيَ وَإِمَّا أَن نَكُونَ أَوَّلَ مَنْ تُلْقَىٰ Oh Moses, either you throw or we will be the first to throw. Right? Let's think of this ayah from two perspectives. From what was the mu'jizah for Musa alayhi salam in this situation? And what, was the, what, and what is the mu'jizah in this as an ayah from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So again, Either you throw or we will be the first to throw. So number one, why is it or we will be the first to throw? Why didn't the ayah say, 
whether you throw or, or we throw first. No, if you notice the difference, or we will be the first to throw. There is, there is a difference between the two, uh, again, the, the order of the words. And there's actually in Imam ibn, ibn Ginni, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, he mentioned beautiful, uh, in his beautiful, uh, he had a book called al Khatriyat. he had some beautiful comments on this ayah, and he said, there is a perspective of wording here and there is a perspective of meaning, right? The wording perspective, he said, you can look at it from a rhythms or rhymes perspective, because the ayat in Surah uh, Shu'ara, uh, there are certain uh, rhyming style of ayat are taken in this part of the Surah. So to, to follow the same smooth rhyming of the ayat, it was better to be like that. So this is from a very, in the forming, the formation of the words. And then he said there is also a meaning aspect that is very important. The ayah is implying that they were very, very overconfident. The ayah is telling you that those people were the best magicians. It's not just like they're they just like being nice and something like, who should go first? It's not, the, the meaning doesn't go. If it was actually, or we throw first, you would understand it like, yeah, they're just telling him like, how do you want to start it, right? How do you want to start the game, basically? But no, the ayah wants to add something beyond this, to say that those people were the best magicians. Those people were very, very, very confident in the work as match. That's why, why after Musa did this, they prostrated right away, right? They right away prostrated saying, this is not real. This is not, I mean, this is not sihr. This is not magic. It is something beyond that. It's exactly what happened to the people in Mecca with the Prophet ﷺ, when they would hear an ayah from the Quran and one time they prostrated subconsciously with how much they were in awe and, and, and intimidated by the power of words. When Surah Al-Najm was revealed and the Prophet ﷺ revealed, uh, recited it loudly and they were uh, uh, hearing it by coincidence. And at the end of the Surah, when he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the end, after Surah Al-Najm is beautiful, talking about Salat wal Mi'raj, this miraculous journey, talking about the Anbiya, the Prophet Subhanallah, very strong Surah. And then at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, which of, you, which, uh, of the blessings and the signs of your Lord you are doubting and, and talking about? This is a word. This is a warning for those people. Uh, it's about to happen. Like the iqab, the punishment is about to happen. The day of judgment is, is, is near. Ayat are very, very powerful and strong. And then at the end, Allah says, So prostrate to Allah and worship Him. All those people in the area who listened to the Prophet ﷺ, they prostrated. And they were not Muslims. They were actually the most uh, aggressive people against them. But they couldn't. They couldn't actually stand that. Try to imagine the situation. Imagine the situation of the magicians in front of Musa ﷺ. SubhanAllah. It's, it's basically the same concept from this perspective that they were very intimidated. They were very overpowered by this because they know this is not actually something that a human being can just make up or invent. It is something beyond that. And the Arabs know, knew this respect to poet, of poetry and language, by the way, because one of them said, uh, one of the beautiful, actually a Muslim scholar who said, They say, it's saying that, do you know these sujood al tilawa when you're reading an ayah that has a sujood and you need to prostrate as a sunnah, they're like, are the 14 or 15 uh, positions in the Quran? They said, there is a sujood, there is a kind of prostration for poetry, right? For sure, he's not equating the ibadah with this, but he's saying, there is this moment when you read a very beautiful poetic line and like you are very touched by it and you feel very intimidated and moved and, and overpowered. It's kind of same feeling when it comes to the language and the part of, of the language. So even something as small like this, and the, beautiful, the beauty about this example is we're trying to analyze it from the two perspectives. How can it work when it's a, a mu'jiza for Musa alayhi salam? And at the same time, how can we analyze it to see the mu'jiza of the Quran and the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then comes the, the question, which is, before all of that, did they actually speak Arabic? Did the magicians say that? Did Musa alayhi uh, did he respond to this? For sure, no, because they did not speak Arabic, right? Neither them nor Musa alayhi were Arabs, by the way. They did not speak Arabic. This is the expression of the Quran, how the Quran is relating the story to us, right? They can't. I did, one of the scholars said, the other ayah, uh, I think in Surah Al-Shu'ara, قَالُوا إِنْ هَذَانِ لَسَاحِرَانِ يُرِيدَانِ أَنْ يُخْرِجَاكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِكُمْ بِسِحْرِهِمَا وَيَذْهَبَا بِطَرِيقَتِكُمْ الْمُثْلَةِ It's a beautiful rhetorical ayah. They said, for sure the missions cannot say these words, right? In, in, in terms of the, the, the for sure, the, the linguistic style. They, they said it in meaning, but the, the structure of the sentence is very powerful. There's actually even two qiraat, two modes of recitation, this ayah that conveys two beautiful uh, 
meaning and there's a long discussion about the syntax of a dual word in Arabic language about Muthanna in Hadani la Sahirani. There are a lot of discussions in linguistics about this. They didn't say it in this way because they did not speak Arabic. The Quran is only expressing about uh, that what happened and the conversation that happened with, between them and uh, Musa alayhi salam. One of the most important questions I probably would conclude with it. Uh, are some parts in the Quran more eloquent and rhetorical than others? Are the, is the Quran all on the same level? So the Quran all is eloquent 100%. The Quran is all in the highest level of rhetoric 100%. But can we say like, yeah, this example is stronger than the other example that is strong as well. So don't get me wrong, but I'm saying if, if we, in, in, in the level of the Quran as a whole, can we see some parts are actually stronger? A lot of scholars said actually, yes. Said the, the variations of rhetorical levels is more challenging, right? Because it's, if it's all on one level, it could be very like, uh, you can say, oh, you know what? It's really, really above our level. We cannot do something like that. But sometimes the Quran would use it like a simple expression in the middle of a sentence to tell them like, it's the language, right? It's the same language you speak. You know, like it's close to the theory of uh, disconnected letters in the Quran, the huruf al-Muqatta'a. When the Quran begins, a lot of surah in the Quran begins with, Alif Lam Mim, Alif Lam Ra, Alif Lam Mim Saad. Some of them is one letter, two letters, three letters, four letters, five letters, right? There are a lot of different uh, combinations of words, of letters. And basically, uh, you, you know, there are a lot of opinions that I've said about this, but one of the most famous opinions is just for a challenge to tell them it's, it's, it's Arabic language, right? You know, when you talk to someone and, and he's not able to, to grasp what you're saying, and then you tell him, I'm speaking English, by the way. Right, you tell them like, by the way, I'm speaking your language. I'm, I'm, I'm using English. I'm not speaking something else. It's kind of similar, right, to, to uh, challenge them more and to defeat them more that this book, this miraculous book, consists of the same literature that you use to compose your speeches. So something similar to this, there are variant uh, rhetorical levels in the Quran, right? It goes like in multiple levels to challenge those people more. And that's why also one meaning can be expressed in multiple ways as well. Right. Then, but the, the thing, the point is to pick the most suitable words to convey this this meaning. Some of the scholars mentioned this beautiful ayah when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wajanan jannatayni uh, dan." In Surah Al-Rahman, the fruit of the two gardens is hanging low. Jannah, the fruit. Jannatayni, the two gardens, the dual of Jannah, paradise, or garden. Dan, asluha fil al Arabiya dani, the rizaya that was embedded for syntax purpose, and then danin. So there's Tanween that substitutes Dayat that was admitted. Then Dani means Qareeb, right? Like Dani minni, Qareeb minni. It's close, it's close to me. So instead of saying close, so the ayah wants to say that these people are enjoying the Jannah, or enjoying the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fruits of the Jannah, and the fruits are near you, so you can pick it whenever you want, right? But the ayah used the word Dani, is hanging low, right? And, and there are a lot of also uh, reflections in Tafsir about this. Hey, why would I use this word? Why would the description of the fruits from, uh, from a tree, instead of saying close to you, saying hang low, right? What, what is, you just like try to, to, to taste the beauty of it without even me trying to explain it to you. Try to taste the, the beauty of it. What is the difference between the fruit of the tree is near to you or the fruit of the tree is hang low? And even some of the scholars said, it means that the fruit itself doesn't know where it's going to land. Right, where it's going to stop hanging because it's hanging low. It keeps hanging low until it reaches near to you. It's a beautiful description of it. It, it paints a it paints a picture for you to imagine the, uh, the 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 state of the people of the Jannah. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala grant it to to all of us, inshallah. So all these different questions covered the uh, different aspects and meanings of the ajaz with the inimitability of the Quran. Last point, and I would actually like to, to begin with it next time, we just like to we'll talk about uh, what it means in general, because it's a very important point. How can we experience this? How do, how do we experience the inimitability of the Quran? If the, if the inimitability means that the Quran is so perfect and unusual, that is impossible to copy its uniqueness, then how can we experience it? And if, if I don't know Arabic, and I, when I say I don't know Arabic, it doesn't mean that I'm an English speaking person or whatever language speaking person. Even if I'm Arabic, but I don't know Arabic that much, because you know a lot of Arabs now, they know really the classical Arabic. None of us basically is up to the level of the fasaha and the eloquence of the Quran. So how can we experience it? What if we don't know how we speak Arabic? And also, with all this explanation that I've uh, uh, presented about, uh, and, and this is for sure backed up by huge literature 
from the scholars about this, this point. None of this is just my reflection. It's all basically uh, in the literature and the books of Ulum al Quran, the books of Ajaz al Quran, a lot of different books and, and references. And some of them, like this beautiful quotation that I put it in Arabic on purpose, that one of the scholars, his name is Bandar al Farisi, was asked about Hajaz al Quran, the immutability of the Quran. And then he said, it's a kind of a misplaced question. You can ask me, what is the exact Hajaz al Quran? Somebody asked him, what is the, the exact point of the inimitability of the Quran? And he said, it's a misplaced question. Or, like in meaning, he's saying that it, it does injustice to the meaning of Hajaz. He said, it, it, It's not just to ask this question like this. He said, He said, It's like if you're telling me, like, what is the, what is the meaning of, of, of a human being to a human being, right? Like, if, if there's a human being and they say, like, what makes him a human being? So he's saying, in, in, in meaning for sure, not, not in physical sense, for example. He's saying, like, when I want to tell a human being, I'm going to point out that this is a human being. It's the essence of a human being is what makes him a human being, right? So he said the same thing about the Quran. He said, لا يشار إلى شيء في. I cannot point out, like, this word or this linguistic style or this rhetorical device or this word. Or like, I cannot do this. It's the overall uh, experience you have with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said, that's why it's inimitable. That's why it cannot be limited in wording, uh, description, or in certain rule or a certain principle that we can just develop, whether in, in whatever the discipline that we can develop this principle in. So I would, I would stop at this point. Uh, inshallah, next time we start from this point again to discuss this question that is, I think, very common. A lot of people are expecting maybe to tackle and talk about that. Why? Uh, what, how can we do it, or how can we understand the inimitability of this book if um, if we're not Arabs or if we didn't know how to speak Arabic? So let's talk about this inshallah next time. And I would actually like to uh, to have a discussion. Probably we can have some interactive uh, discussion about how can we test, feel, uh, experience, live the meanings of the Quran in a way that make us just taste a little bit of its beauty and if its uh, inimitability. So inshallah, let's talk about this next time and. I would really encourage you if you have some thoughts, ideas, personal experiences, personal stories that you want to share with us, uh, specifically then our speaking uh, brothers and sisters who are with us, how can you feel the power of these words, uh, even if you didn't really Arabic that much? What would help you to connect with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not only to know the meanings of the tafsir, not only to read meanings of the tafsir, I'm talking about to connect with this uh, inimitability uh, or this ijaz, this, the, how, how does this book intimidate you? with the power of its language and the power of its words with the least amount of knowledge you know about the language that this book was written in. So inshallah, let's begin next time with this conversation, uh, and again, we can have a group discussion about it, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, inshallah, make us able to, to connect with the Quran more and to understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Jazakumullah khairan wa barakallahu feekum. See you inshallah next Monday at the same time. Uh, بارك الله فيكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته